Some of you know what corn is, but others don't know what podcorn is. And I'm happy to settle that fact because not only is podcorn a marketplace to connect podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities, but they're also the sponsor of today's episode. I'm a proud user of podcorn and I love that on their site, there is no middle ban. Mr. Moneybags, big businessman isn't going to get in my way of collaborating directly with brands. Now, podcasters of all sizes can browse and choose opportunities right on the Podcorn platform. They can set their own rates and they can collaborate with brands directly without any exclusivities. You never give up any rights to your podcast on Podcorn. They're here to support you at every step and make sure that you're protected and compensated for your work with brands. You know, by the way, everybody out there, I listened to your last podcast episode, loved it, great job, but you know what could make your pod a little bit better? A sponsor that you found with the help of Podcorn. So if you're looking for sponsors for your excellent podcast, head on over to podcorn.com slash podcasters and explore sponsorship opportunities and start monetizing your podcast by signing up today. Thanks to Podcorn for sponsoring today's episode. From the mountains of Switzerland to the deserts of Morocco, everybody across the world is asking this one question, including Spectre themselves. Is James Bond still relevant? And we're going to answer that question today because your Geek History Lesson is now in session. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Jason Shaken, not stirred, Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or super spy from pop culture and teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour, except this week because we've done like four or five or six, I don't know how many, James Bond episodes. <laughs> So we're, we're going to do another one. I do like the idea, though, of uh, Andrew Scott as a proxy of Spectre being like, but is James Bond still real? <laughs> I don't know. Well, our mm. listeners know <laughs> that we have been going through uh, most of the Bond films. There's still a chap that we have not. There's two chaps that we've not hit up in terms That's of the Bonds. True. But we have been loosely going through for the last couple of years a series because, of, as we all know, No Time to Die was supposed to come out uh, last year. It did not. It got delayed. So... We thought that this would be the perfect wrap up to our two year Bond series to (laughs) actually have a discussion about James Bond and and his relevancy in the year of 2021 and the future. Now, we all know that No Time to Die is in theaters right now at the time that you're listening to this podcast. Fun fact, I just want to say, and that's not really a fun fact, there will be no spoilers for No Time to Die. Uh, I have not seen No Time to Die. Ashley has not seen No Time to Die. And as far as I know, our special guest has not seen No to Die. But maybe we need to ask her. And Ashley, let's bring her on the podcast. So today, because Jason and I couldn't possibly do this alone, we are joined by the fabulous Danielle Price, who is the co-host of The Anglophiles and a featured talent on James Bonding. Danielle, welcome to Geek History Lesson. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. Now, Danielle, I want to ask you. um, Have you seen No Time to Die? Oh, yeah. Have you seen No Time to Die? (laughs) I have not seen it yet. I have the tickets. Tickets are bought. We do, too. Um, We do, too. Yeah. The data said I'm excited. Uh, Yeah, but I have not seen it yet. I'm trying not to hear too many things. Me, too. Me, too. (laughs) And I, I already feel... I've already, I won't, I will not say what it is, but I already feel like I've been spoiled on a little thing that I wish I did not know now. Um, But anyways... Danielle, we have to ask, because I know our listeners are asking this as well, our our, our excellent Mind University (laughs) students, they're saying to themselves, Danielle, (laughs) what is your bona fides when it comes to James Bond? I mean, how much have you loved James Bond? When did you first see James Bond? uh, Let's hear some of your your, your love and your expertise around James Bond. Hmm, Okay. Um, Yeah, I definitely first started watching them. um, Well, I mean, I, I saw them. Uh, when I was a kid in the 90s, there was it feels like there was always a Roger Moore marathon on TV. <laughs> so like just perpetually on. So <clears throat> my dad would put them on. And so I definitely remember seeing little bits of them um, when I was very young, just on TV. 
Um, didn't know what I was watching, but later when I watched all the movies, realized, oh, I remember this from being a kid. Um, yeah, and then in my early 20s, um, <laughs> I was looking through used books and I found a <clears throat> James Bond encyclopedia book. Ooh. And I think when it came out, Skyfall was about to come out. And so I was like, this is great because it listed everything from villains to every Bond, every Bond girl. And um, that's when I started to really be attracted to this franchise um, from that standpoint, just from a history standpoint, because it's such a long franchise and I'm a sucker for lore, especially a franchise that has a ton of lore and <laughs> this franchise does. So um, I just got really, really nerdy about wanting to know, like, you know, who are all the villains? Who are all the henchmen? Like, what terrorist organizations has he fought? So I got really into it, I think, kind of from a um, from that standpoint. We should um, we should also make this clear just for all the listeners that uh, I I'm a huge fan of the Ian Fleming original novels but for the for the perspective of today's conversation mm -hmm. this will only be covering um the 27 film productions actually it won't be covering two of them because only 25 <laughs> of them were made by eon productions uh mm -hmm. but it will only be covering the films that have been starring actors such as sean connery george lazenby roger moore timothy dalton pierce brosnan and daniel craig so all you david niven fans out there just need to <laughs> slow your roll yeah, i know yeah. i'm with you i'm with you but slow down uh, we're only gonna be talking about those films. Um, I would great. encourage you if you would like to remain a fan of him, don't check out his memoir, My Wicked Wicked Way. <laughs> Yikes! That also would be a great autobiography uh, title for James Bond. Truly, it's it's kind of yeah. funny because I feel mm -hmm. like by a modern standard, he like preemptively canceled himself. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Well, that's great. That's all. So, I, wait, Danielle, do you still have the James Bond encyclopedia? I do. It's oh, actually in front of me right now. Oh, um, oh you're going to be you're going to be like using a, a kind of a cheat sheet as you're going to the podcast. Yeah, if you hear some pages flipping. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I didn't think I would need to reference it, but I just, you know, I, maybe ceremonially, ceremonially, I was like, oh, I'm going to record this. I better bring this book in here with me. Yeah, but, it's good vibes. Um, that is a well-prepared yeah. teacher's assistant. I love it. Uh, yeah, Ashley, yeah. Uh, well, listener, just to let everybody know, Ashley is well prepared most of the questions for today. She did an amazing job. So, Ashley, let's just um, start the conversation off. Why don't you kick us off? OK, so we're going to start with a question that is pretty close to the theme of what we're discussing today. Um, I pulled this from a 2018 Den of Geek article written by Tim George, uh, and he wrote, quote, when Bond was created, the Cold War had only just begun and Britain was slowly coming to the realization that it was no longer a world power, end quote. So with that into consideration, I want to ask both of you, we'll start with Jason, because oh, right. we're going to we're going to let Daniel ease into this. <laughs> Is a Cold War hero inspired by a Second World War character archetype? Is that the person that modern filmmakers should be positioning as a hero? That is such a difficult question because I. Yeah, so we'll get it out of the yeah, way first thing. <laughs> honest, my, my honest answer to that is yes and no. Sure. Because mm -hmm. yes, because I do think the Cold War is a fascinating era of history and how the world powers were very much always on this precipice of nuclear war. And that sort of leans and, and feeds the giant um, perspective of the James Bond franchise, that there are these huge organizations, these madmen, these these villains out there. But also, when you think about it, we at this point are now 30 years removed from the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And the world is quite different. And, you know, I, I don't. I, I don't know. I, I've said this, I think, on some of our other James Bond episodes where I, I do think that there is a decent idea of possibly making James Bond a period piece mm -hmm. of like that. It's always set during the cold war because there, it, there are a lot of James Bond tropes and stuff that only work in that time period. And you can see how much the franchise, sometimes the movie franchise bends over backwards to make these like 1970s and these 1980 things work past that time period. Um, mm -hmm. I think there, there's the Pierce Brosnan film uh, franchise of James Bond is full of those things. So, um, it, to me, it, it truly is a yes or no. Like it can be well, it can be done very well, but we've also seen it done 
very, very <laughs> badly. And I think you're still seeing it in the Daniel Craig films that the producers are still struggling with this. How do we make this Cold War, basically superhero work in a 2021 world? Yeah. 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 Yep. What, how do you sense. feel about this, Danielle? Um, I completely agree with you when it comes to yes and no. <laughs> because, um, yeah, it's like, I feel like the character in the franchise have already evolved past the need for the Cold War as a setting. Um, I know that in the Everything or Nothing documentary, there they kind of mentioned that there was a little bit of worry um, when Goldeneye came out because the Cold War had ended. They were like, does this still work? And Goldeneye worked very well. So they were like, cool, we can keep going. Um, so I do think that this is a franchise that can work, um, no matter how far from its origin it gets. Um, but at the same time, it still has that origin, you know? So it's just hard to get away from it. And I do agree with you. I mentioned this to somebody else, um, that it would be kind of cool if it became a period piece. Yeah, um, like all in the 60s. Like it's always in the 60s. Like yeah. I, I would love that. It would be cool, but you would lose um, some of the traditions of the franchise, which include, you know, showcasing the fashion of the time, showcasing weird trends for the better or worse. You know, I feel like when you watch Bond films, you're seeing like, Cutting edge technology, although in some movies it's very, very cheesy um, technology. But um, like in Casino Royale, there's parkour. Yeah, I was just about to bring that up. Yeah. (laughs) Like watching it now, you're like, wow, remember when parkour was like the biggest thing in the world? (laughs) It's kind of like it's it's always been cool that it's been able to really like showcase all these amazing things that are like the newest of the new. Um, But... Yeah, I don't know. I feel like the last couple films haven't really been able to do that. I will say, Danielle, real quick, to bounce off of what you've been saying about the trends and stuff like that. I do specifically remember watching Casino Royale in theaters and thinking to myself, oh, wow, this is the first film I've ever seen where people are texting. Mm-hmm. Mm. It was like 2006. And they were mm-hmm. like, there was so much of that phone is about people texting ellipsis to each other. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> wow. I so I I just rewatched Casino Royale um, a couple days ago, and I didn't even think about that. Yeah, yeah. I remember that was the. I I remember like you know like texting wasn't a new thing at that time period, but I remember seeing James Bond text and thinking like, oh, it's main like everybody texts now. If James yep. Bond texts, <laughs> uh, Ashley, what do you how do you feel about this? I think it's really interesting that you both um, not only agree on this, but this is a conversation that Jason and I have had a lot about the Fantastic Four oh, over yes. at Marvel, mm. um, which very much comes out of that post Kennedy rah rah. We are Americans and we can do anything and we're going to, you know, and this like period of upheaval in terms of like sciences um, and and society. And I think Bond is sort of like the English pop culture version of that, because obviously mm. the Cold War uh, went over very differently overseas than it. I feel like it was a bigger thing in America. Um, I'm sure our nice English friends, sorry, Jordan, um, <laughs> are going to are going to disagree with me. And I think like everything that is more than. And I think a lot of superheroes fall under this. I think like any property that's more than maybe 20 years old, it's hard to eat your cake and have it too, to have one foot genuinely planted when this was created, Mm -hmm. but then still make it feel modern and fresh because uh, my favorite Felix Leiter is not a white guy from Texas. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? And Mm -hmm. um, seeing women that Bond is not uh, uh, sexually harassing at every turn is really great. I want to say to all our listeners who are big Jack Lord fans from Dr. No, uh, (laughs) I apologize. I don't I don't lean with Ashley. Jack Lord all the way. You think Jack Lord is the best Felix Leiter? I think he's the coolest Felix Leiter. You're incorrect. Jeffrey Wright <laughs> is one always the coolest person in any room, and he's definitely the coolest. Very Felix. cool. Jeffrey Wright is a robot to me, and that's some Westworld spoilers. <laughs> Honestly, make Felix a robot. That would be that's the twist I want. I want Rami Malek to reveal that Felix wow. leiter has been a robot the whole and time. has been the whole time. Dun dun, and then Ed Harris walks out of the shadow. I only have like three or yep. four Westworld touches. 
touchstones I've never seen on the show. But now that we've completely derailed it, well, uh, what next? <laughs> we, were t- we were talking about trends and how uh, James Bond loses connections to um, the modern world. It is very influenced by like trends in the modern world. But Danielle, mm-hmm. I want to ask you, um, it's interesting because James Bond in a lot of ways is very analog. Mm-hmm. He is a guy that has to be in the room for him to be able to perform his espionage. So you're going to pass up the Hamilton joke. I mean, Oh, in the room. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't even, that didn't, I'm thinking about James Bond over here. <laughs> um, it, it, do you think James Bond is in danger of becoming tropey? Uh, because there seems to have been several James Bond movies post cold war where a lot of the storyline has been, well, should the double O's even exist? Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, I mean, the franchise has already become very tropey. <laughs> so I don't I mean, I feel like it's still in danger of being more tropey. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as, you know, how much do we need a spy to be there in the room? Um, I personally think it works. Some of my favorite um, moments in in the Bond film history. Some of my favorite moments in any spy story is um, when a spy is playing people face to face and either impersonating someone or, you know, just getting away with something. Um, I love when a spy gets caught in like a little lie or something and they have to like think really quickly and cover it. Um, so I think Bond is at his best when he's face to face with people. And so I know that that now that we're like living in an age of, you know, we're getting all of our data digitally and all of our intelligence is kind of done that way. Um, I know that it's probably harder to, um, keep Bond, (laughs) you know, the guy, like the guy you have to send instead of just like wiretapping. But um, I think that if you can make that work, then it's incredible. What do you think, Ashley? I would like to say to all of the spies who are currently listening, I hope you all remain employed. <laughs> and please don't please don't track our signals and come to my house. <laughs> um, it's tough. And I think Skyfall did a good job grappling with it in the scene where we meet Q for the first time, um, which is mm-hmm. one of my favorite James Bond scenes because I love... Ben, I was going to call him Little Ben Wisha. He is ben much older than I am. <laughs> he is a grown up person. Um, I love the discussion between like, I can do more from, you know, in my pajamas from my couch. My first cup getting out of bed. Yeah, yeah whatever. Then, then you can do. And it's like, well, sometimes you need someone to pull the trigger. And I think that Bond stories trade on that. And then they trade on the fact that like, we like attractive people fighting each other mm. on, on screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Hong Kong built a whole film <laughs> studio <laughs> system based on that. Um, but I think the analogness is what should be leaned into more. And I think this is why we keep touching on the idea of a period piece. And and I, I'm sure we're going to bring it up later um, or address it later. But something like Kingsman, which... Mm. Uh, is set in the modern day Mm -hmm. does also a really good job at straddling that. And I think bond has just slowly because it's such a behemoth been moving Mm -hmm. more toward that. It's interesting you bring it up Kingsman because uh, at the time of this recording, Ken, we we're still before this release of the third Kingsman movie, which is actually going to be a period piece. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which so it'll be interesting to see if, the Kingsman franchise is like kind of loses all of its specialness because it's suddenly a period piece. Mm. You know, it's interesting. Interesting. That film might be a weird precursor for uh, James Bond in the future. Like if, mm-hmm. if James Bond could successfully achieve a period piece movie. Yeah. I, I'd love to see it, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be mad about it for one second. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to me because, you know, you're talking about the tropiness and Bond being obsolete. To me, it all comes down to like, it's exactly the superhero argument mm-hmm. because like when you think about, our superheroes, the Marvel superheroes fighting a person like Galactus or Thanos. Yeah. The least logical and tactical way to do that is to walk up on the guy and punch him in the face. The same thing was with, <laughs> with Batman. Like Bruce yeah. Wayne is a billionaire. Yeah. He could actually help Gotham in much more meaningful ways than 
dressing yeah. up and endangering the lives of children, but yeah. that's good storytelling. You know, because <laughs> I, I actually do think in a modern world mm-hmm. um, that Bond is obsolete. I think that secret agent is is Dunzo. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sorry, you guys all listening right now that have been like put into the office to just like <laughs> filter through podcasts. Yeah, I, w- I wish you went to I wish you went to Morocco, too, but it doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> they don't have the budget when they can email it. But. I think for movies, I think my the reason why I think I wanted to really include this question Mm -hmm. is because I think we as viewers of Bond have all accepted the trope like we know what we're getting with a Bond movie. And I and I don't appreciate the movie producers and the writers constantly being like, well, is Bond obsolete? Maybe he is. I don't know. It's like every, they, they just keep reminding us of it. Yeah. And I'm like, look, we've all accepted this suspension of disbelief. It's the same as um, every Mission Impossible movie is about Ethan Hunt becoming going rogue. Mm-hmm. Like he goes rogue in every single Mission Impossible <laughs> movie. And it's like, we've accepted that that is part of the franchise. <laughs> but an interesting thing that I think um, Bond has just due to the length, the, like how old the IP is, is we have seen some of the tropes Evolve. Yeah, that's like very tropes true. are tropes for a reason. Trope is not always a, a bad word. I know we're using it like a touch pejoratively here. Um, and I know we have another question about it that we'll get to, but like even looking at the way Bond girls have evolved over the years, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, Naomi Harris is very different from some of the earlier Bond girls, for example. Do you just want to go to the Bond girl question? Sure. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to skip right down to this question. So, Bond girls, like I said, have been evolving. Do they need to keep evolving? Do we feel like Bond girls are fully realized women of the future, Danielle? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is like the one of the hardest. Um, <laughs> it's one of the hardest things to address, I think, when talking mm-hmm. about this franchise as a fan, but also as a feminist. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had so many thoughts, uh, <laughs> because yeah, like it, it, the, the franchise has had such a problematic history with female characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, it has gotten better, but, um, personally, what I want to see are, um, you know, female agents. I mm-hmm. know and there have been some that he ends up working with. And sometimes it's romantic. Um, but that's really what I want to see. If if I want to see cool women in this franchise, I want to see them doing exactly what he does and what Bond has been doing. Um, and it doesn't, to me, have to be a like, wow, she's doing it even better. But just like, just show them as equals side by side mm-hmm. um, with the same abilities and skills. And um, that I think would be great. <laughs> Well, and if the trailers are to be believed uh, for No Time mm-hmm. to Die, it looks like we're getting a couple of uh, yep. two like very strong women in the in the, in the upcoming movie. That and I, I know am all, very all, excited for. All our listeners are screaming at us. They're like, "We've seen it! You're behind the times!" And it's like, "Look, that's this is how that's we record how our podcast." Producing words. Look, just like James Bond, we're also analog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Ashley, what about you? I want to hear from from the other woman on the podcast. Um, what? How would? How much further? Or let, let's say this. Actually, and Danielle, feel free to chime in on this as well. Mm-hmm. Um, do the Bond movies need to evolve Bond girls even more yes. than what they've done? <laughs> yes, and, unequivocally. Yes. Well, and I, I would love to either one of you, uh, any do you, Ashley, if you would like to go first. Sure. Do you have any? What would be like your pitches for evolving them? So it's tough because Bond girls are sex objects, of course. And I, I fully think in James Bond there is room for sex and sexuality. Mm-hmm. That's a really dynamic part of what somebody doing that type of job would actually realistically have to be willing to do and have to have as a skill oh, it set. Is, it is a hundred, it is a hundred, again, I, I only keep bringing up these things because uh, weirdly listeners, I literally just spent the last year on a on a television show that was all about espionage. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and our showrunner made us read the CIA field manual of espionage, which is a very dry read, <laughs> wow. but very fascinating. And there is so much in espionage, especially if you ever look up the honeypot trap. Oh, I'm familiar. Where, where yeah. you're like specifically enticing somebody Mm -hmm. with sexuality to like give up the missile codes. So, (laughs) And and I have no issue with women being sexual. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of things that need to change are like very like small production minded things. Like 
Uh, could the Bond girls be the same age as the actor playing James Bond? Oh, uh, that's fair. Um, <laughs> Monica Bellucci, I think, is the first woman. I was going to say, only once. Who has been of of age, of peerage with the lead. She still looked incredible. The yeah. character was nothing and a complete waste of space. <laughs> but even like, um, and Daniel Craig, I know, very much um, advocated for that as well. But obviously, he's not a producer. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was a great champion of her being inspector and... Look, she looked great. I wasn't sad that she was there or anything like that. But I think that's like, to me, like, that is step one. Step two is like, give them some lines. Step three is like, the way you shoot it. Like, you can shoot a sex scene so it's less male gazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bridgerton, which I think has too many sex scenes, actually I think does a really good job <laughs> at accomplishing something like that. Can I can I ask a follow-up question mm-hmm. on that? Would you consider, because um, you said the male gaze, of course, yes, in case anybody doesn't yeah. know, is, would you consider Bridgerton to be an excellent uh, POV of the female gaze of I would, sex scenes I would movies say or television? Br- Bridgerton and um, Anya Taylor-Joy's Emma are a great job mm-hmm. of like a more feminine All right, good to gaze know. in filmmaking. So there you go, everybody. If you want to know specifically what that is, now you have some touchstones. But I thought um, my big into James Bond um, was Casino Royale, which I think for a lot of people and a lot of women, I think of my generation, it was as well. Um, Vesper to me is like the closest thing we've come. Um, and she, I think, fulfills a lot of the things that Danielle was talking about. Like, yes, they're love interests, but like she is as smart and as capable. I mean, mm-hmm. ultimately smarter because she plays them. And she's a villain. Then, yeah, then she's Bond. Technically like, a she's, villain. she's technically like three different roles, mm-hmm. but I, I think that. Even if you want the trope of the Bond girl just being the babe who he sleeps with for in one scene to get the information, I just think you could do it more dynamically. That's not a word. Um, <laughs> and I think Bond actually has done an okay job compared to other franchises in their diverse casting. Like we had Grace Jones mm-hmm. as a Bond girl, but I would love to see that keep evolving. Dan- um, Danielle, yeah. let me let me bounce a question that is sort of on, in the same conversation mm-hmm. um, to keep the Bond girls evolving to to get the correct um, female perspective in there. Would making more of the villains female solve this or help towards this issue? That is a great question. Because there haven't um, been many James Bond female villains. Yeah. I mean, you, you, yeah. Cause and I'm talking about the big, the big villain, not the, um, hench not women. the hench. Yeah. Not the hench I was going to say like Rosa club comes to mind, but I believe she is a henchman. Um, so, uh, Sophie Marceau, I think. In the world is not enough. She's the big henchman. Yeah. Or the, yeah, she's the big villain. She, yeah. And that I, I think was like the first, like actual female villain. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that movie is great. I don't um, think that's a controversial opinion. Uh, no, it's, 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 it's <laughs> all right. It's all right. For me, it's got like da- like heavy downsides, but I think it's got some things that really shine. Like, for instance, Sophie Marceau. Oh, we also forgot. I'm sorry. I just want, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Danielle. Um, I went I went and Googled. Uh, we, we all forgot Rosa Klebb is considered to be the main villain in From Russia with Love because she's the person that sends. Um, Oh God, the um, oh the gentleman on the yeah. train sends uh, Red Grant. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. But uh, um, yeah, so I consider her to be a villain. But I have been told, and I think it was on the James Bonding podcast by Matt Myra that she is. I mean, he considers her a uh, henchman. Oh, it's so interesting. I don't know. Some mm. of this might be subjective. Yes, and Electric King was the villain from The World Is Not Enough. She's yeah. definitely the main villain. And yeah, so the so there we go. I just looked at the giant list. Uh, according to the James Bond wiki, they only consider two females to be official villains and not henchmen. Mm-hmm. Not hench people. Yes, hench people. Excuse me. They, oh, dear. I'm looking right at the word that says henchmen. So. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, like, I mean, would that solve it or, or like or do you think do you think the issue is to, you know, put more contemporaries like do we need they they attempted this with Jinx and Die Another Day mm-hmm. where they tried to create the she was a CIA agent. She was yeah, like yeah. sort of a female contemporary. Of yeah, James she was Bond. like a, a Felix analog almost. Yes, exactly. Yeah, in a lot of ways. And they were going to spin well, her off into her own movie for a while. And um, the spy who loved me also. Yes. Um, yeah. She was she was kind of like. <laughs> A female James Bond. Um, Anya, I think. And she is incredible. And I love her. Um, I think so, the issue is they all have to die, right? Or or go away and never come back. So no matter what, they're not getting I mean, a 27th of the character development that Bond is going to get. Because he's going to show up in the next movie and the next yeah. movie and the next movie. I mean, maybe... Like, I personally don't need for there to be a romance. Mm-hmm. Um, flirtation's great. 
And uh, I agree with you, Ashley. Like, I, it's not that I don't want to see mm-hmm. sex or sexuality mm-hmm. in the franchise, but it's like, do we need to make these awesome female characters always end up with him romantically? I don't think we do. Well, so uh, I, I want to ask this because um, one of my favorite moments in Skyfall, and I think I've brought this up in every single James Bond podcast we've done, is when Silva has Bond tied to the chair and he's like, oh, Mr. Bond, your first time. And without mm-hmm. missing a beat, Daniel Craig's like, what makes you think this is my first time? So do you think there will ever... Goes, oh, Mr. Mr. Bond. Bond. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's boyfriend, Javier Bardem. <laughs> my mom is not actually dating you Javier Bardem. You heard here first. I wish. <laughs> she is obsessed with him. Uh, so, so Danielle, I want to ask you, because I know Jason's answer to this. Uh, will we ever see a Bond guy? And would we like to see it? Um, I would love to see it. Uh, Me too. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, that would be great. I think if... Um, you know, like mainstream society ever understood the concept of bisexuality, then Uh. it it would be received (laughs) a little better um, unless. Yeah. So, I mean, that would be cool. I all I know is that (laughs) I've seen a lot of um, fandoms speaking up in the last five years about, oh, my franchise is becoming woke, complaining and complaining and complaining. And honestly, from what I've seen from the Bond online fans, they are not as bad as you would think they are. Mm, you could say that <laughs> more, nobody, more. But also nobody ever accuses James Bond of being woke. <laughs> That's fair. Oh, no, 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 That's no, fair. no, 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 no. But I, but I am saying like, mm-hmm. you know, we've seen um, Felix Slater become black and mm-hmm. Money Penny become black. And... Um, yeah, I I just I was expecting a more toxic online fandom with mm-hmm. the Bond fandom, but from what I have seen, it is nothing compared to the Star Wars fandom. Maybe so, they're more oh. gentlemanly. Maybe. Maybe. Or gentle Maybe. womanly. Gentle. Maybe know. they have a, they're better class. I don't yeah. I would love I, to, I, I agree with you, Danielle. Like I kind of feel that I would love to see a Bond guy. I think it would be mm-hmm. such a step forward. To me, I think it's totally in the character. And if you've read the Ian Fleming like <clears throat> books or even the comics or seen any of the movies mm. and you think that James Bond has not kissed or slept with a man, you are you're watching. Fooling you're fooling yourself. <laughs> it's all there, man. Like James Bond, if the mission would be accomplished, would marry a car. He would do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yep. um, you know, he would do it. That's like the mission. It doesn't matter who he has to kiss or bed or anything. He mm-hmm. will do it. Bond is um, also just like as a franchise, just begging because they've done it with the women sometimes for like an enemies to lovers story. And you have two ooh, huge dudes ooh. in a fist fight. Like, come on. I mean, I already (laughs) feel like so the the train fight in From Russia with Love with him and Robert Shaw, that is slightly homoerotic. If you slightly (laughs) (laughs) the way that he kills him at the end, this like release that he has when he's yeah, it's uh, so I feel like, yes, we've already had the stirrings yes <laughs> yes so, you know and I, and I would even argue that i don't think that's the only bond fight that has some homoeroticism in there mm-hmm. i i re- there are some you know and and that i think goes to this idea that you know bond is all about style and and and, and you know and, and 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 it's and his attitude like there's even you can even get the impression that when scaramanga invites james bond in the in the man with the golden gun to his island Mm -hmm. and like he gives him dinner before their grand duel you get the impression that it's almost a date they're always on a date yeah Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. like like you're like like this is like scaramanga wants to kill james bond but if the roles like if if it just pivoted just a little bit they might get married (laughs) (laughs) um that would have been so funny just with that movie specifically with it being christopher lee who is Mm. you know arguably the real james Bond. yeah <laughs> um and that goes into um our next thing because we want to talk about um well actually before we get to this uh, danielle i want to ask we talked about the bond guy mm-hmm. and this has been a question that's been given to daniel craig very recently mm-hmm. um is there anything to a woman stepping into the role of james bond a female an actual female james bond um yeah i mean people have been talking about 
James Bond as a code name mm-hmm. for a while. Um, so it's one of those things where I would rather, if this were to happen, I would rather it be a female 007, some female agent who is not James Bond takes over his code name. Um, that's actually how I would like to see this franchise progress. I would love to keep seeing um, 007 spy stories produced by Eon, but no longer with a white man in the role. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, so to answer your question, yes and no. I don't know if I need her to be James Bond, but it would be great to have a female 007. Well, just to let everybody know, Daniel Craig, in an interview with the BBC Radio Times, was asked this very question, and his answer was, he said, and I quote, the answer to that is very simple. There should simply be better parts for women and actors of color. Why should a woman play James Bond when there should be a part just as good as James Bond, but for a woman? Uh, Mm -hmm. Ashley, how, what do you feel about a female James Bond and even uh, Mr. Craig's statements? Yeah, I feel very much the same way as Danielle. Like I am something I'm really looking forward to in No Time to Die. Stop yelling at your iPhone if you've already seen it um, <laughs> is seeing a woman in the role of 007. 007. But I don't like if in the next movie they were like uh, Haley Atwell is Janie Bond. I'm like, I am not interested in that. Yeah, That's for sure. She won't because she's in Mission Impossible now forever. So <laughs> I think also like we wouldn't want to see um, some awesome female actress come in and then suddenly be relegated to the entire history that this man has had. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> So I would rather it be like a fresh start, new character. But I don't think Eon is going to give it to us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's interesting is that I have heard, I mean, you know, who knows what happens in the new movie, but I was hearing rumors last year that we were heading the direction of a female 007, that, that James Bond himself was retiring. That was the rumor. And I was so happy. And I was like, yes, this is the only way that this franchise can continue. <laughs> um, and then now all these things are com- like going around where it's like, oh, who's next? Like, who's going to be the next James Bond? Here are the favorites, the fan casting. Um, and I keep ignoring it because I'm like, mm, wouldn't it be cool if it if it wasn't him anymore. <laughs> well, you know, I guarantee you they had that meeting. I guarantee you they sat in a, in a boardroom and batted it around and actually like talked about like what it would be. But I think that is actually not going to happen because in the same interview with the BBC Radio Times, actually, Barbara mm-hmm. Broccoli said uh, Barbara Broccoli, producer and owner of the rights to mm-hmm. James Bond, said he's a male character. He was written as male, and I think he'll probably always stay male. We don't have to turn male characters into women. Let's just create more female characters. Yeah, Mm -hmm. well, hopefully they'll do that. (laughs) That's what I hope so, too. So they've already done it in the franchise. M Mm -hmm. was always a man um, until Judi Dench came in and took on the role of M. And again, she's not playing the same M that we've seen in all the previous movies. Uh, Also, arguably, I mean, not arguably, the best M we've ever uh yeah <laughs> also arguably the best bond girl ever uh yes <laughs> yeah. she's technically the bond girl of skyfall i say that all the time yeah, <laughs> yeah. she dies at the end and everything she dies in the end she's the bond girl uh, yeah. um you know let's talk about this uh danielle we, we talked about like how is bond going to change how it's going to be relevant but like what do you think james bond as a franchise does well like what is mm. it good at Ooh. Uh, locations, depending on the film. Heck yeah. Good call. Um, that's something that you can always count on. I mean, like, Spectre, I need to rewatch it, but I was very, I wasn't underwhelmed. I wasn't overwhelmed with Spectre. I was just very whelmed and um, didn't love the story. But you know, when you go to see one of these movies, you're going to see very nice looking cars, very nice clothes on everyone and usually great locations. <laughs> I think um, The World is Not Enough is one in which the locations were just not great. Yeah, because they, sp- they spend most of the time near in the Baltic Sea. <laughs> like they're, all, they're all, yeah, they're like basically they 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 stay in the, um, Eastern Europe for a lot, most of it, yeah. for most of the movie. Um, you know, I think, God, the locations is something because I, I you've always read these in some of the Bond uh, bio books and stuff like that, that people talk about that 
in the 60s and 70s when Bond would go to these exotic locations, the reason why they think a lot of the Bond movies blew up was because it was showing people that would never be able to travel to those places what these places look like. It was pre-internet. Mm-hmm. It was pre-internet before the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I agree with you. I, that's something I would really like Bond uh, to have. Because like, I know, like, and this is a joke from the James Bonding podcast, uh, Bond has <laughs> never been to Canada. Not once. He, he's only been to America twice. Uh, especially I mean, what are you going to do? Have him run across the tundra? Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, there's got to be some location. There's got to be a waterfall or that's, something in Canada. Yeah, we have the, the you know? we have the largest waterfall in North America. Um, Maybe because it is North America, they're like, eh, not exotic enough. Well, Bond has also never been to Australia. He's, he's like, you know what? I am from England. F the other Commonwealth. That's kind of what it seems like. It's kind of <laughs> seems like. Um, you know, something that I would say that I think Bond does really well and this also is what I think creates part of the problematic nature of Bond is Bond movies have a style and a tone to them that other movies don't. Mm -hmm. And almost to where they are so much of a dream fantasy. Like Mm -hmm. part of the Bond movies, I feel, and part of the reason why I think Bond has become this cipher is because, uh, and this happens to me in certain scenes, is I feel sometimes when you're watching a Bond movie, like you see yourself as Bond walking through that movie. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's something that like, I think that can is. I, can, I, can I interrupt you really quick? Please. Do you think that's because you're a man? Uh, I don't feel that way when I watch James well, Bond Well, yes, movies. I do. I think that is definitely for a male audience. Yeah. But but I mean, you know, that is the sad thing to say that the James Bond movies do scale skew heavily male. Yeah, I don't even think they're trying to do Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, um, you know, which is why I was so excited to have uh, uh Danielle, uh, two female, uh, uh, awesome <laughs> co-hosts here. That's why I was like, yeah, um, I didn't want this to be a sausage bond party. Um, anyways, but you no, know, they, for, for definitely for male viewers, they, I do think they take on that. Like, Oh yeah, I could wear that suit. They and do I could also tell you in, in and, every single movie that like, Hey, bond was like a poor orphan. Like he he's was. not, he, he is yep. supposed to be every, but there's every that, British person. There's that air of he's the coolest guy in the world. And Mm -hmm. and it's interesting that even in the movies where they try to knock that down, like Skyfall, where they're just like, oh, man, he's an old man. He's still the coolest guy in the world. (laughs) Like, you know, like every movie, he's the coolest guy in the world. Um, And it's interesting that Daniel Craig franchise has been a lot of films about like he's not he's tired. He's haggard. He doesn't like the government anymore. And you're like, no, but he's still the coolest guy in the world. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Ashley, what do you think the Bond franchise does really well? Uh, I think they do a really good job casting really pretty people. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, I also think we like Bond movies because of something that uh, you both brought up earlier. We like the familiarity. You know what a James Bond movie is going to be. And even the garbagiest James Bond movies, and there's more than <laughs> one, I'm, I'm sad to say, mm. uh, your mileage on which one those are may vary. Um, they're all still going to give you uh, the opening fight scene, they're going to give you the barrel shot. They're going to give you the Bond girl. They're going to give you at least two countries. They're going to give you a lecture from M. They're going to give you gadgets from Q. Like, we go to Bond movies to see those things, which is why Casino Royale, in a lot of ways, is such an outlier because it's it's absent mm-hmm. of a lot of those mm-hmm. things. Or even the song and the title sequence. Exa- mm-hmm. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what you're getting into. And I think especially for, um, I think most consumers now grew up watching bond in some way shape or form because the franchise is so old it's like kids grow up you just know who batman what was the is. cable was it tnt their spike that did the 24 spike hours of TV, bond the network for mm-hmm. men yeah. 28 days of 007 yeah every time there was a new <laughs> wow. bond they would do 24 thanks, hours of bond. For Thanksgiving. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. It's well, crazy. 15 days of double whatever whatever it was <laughs> yeah yep it was so weird for like most of the 90s bond films were thanksgiving movies <laughs> America, which, is, which is weird things. which is very <laughs> yeah. which is very weird um yeah i think um that's that's so interesting i think die another day was my first in theater i think mine was the world is not enough mine was casino Royale. <laughs> <laughs> wow ours are all three like back to back yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah, so yeah. funny wow yeah, yeah. um all right danielle um katie rosinski asked in the evening standard how long Bond can remain a big screen behemoth in the streaming center era of content overlord, excuse me, overload before concluding mm-hmm. dragging Britain's cinemas out of the COVID doldrums is probably Bond's toughest mission yet. And the entire industry will be watching to see if he can pull it off. So no time to die. 
even more so than Black Widow, was the film that got delayed more than any other film. Uh, wow. um, I think it's been delayed like six times at this point. Wow. Um, I'm actually surprised. At the time of this recording, No Time to Die has not opened. And I will say to listeners it that- It hasn't opened domestically. hasn't opened domestically. It's opened internationally. But I still yeah. think they're going to pull the rug out from under us and delay it again. Like oh, there's yeah. still part of me where I'm like, oh, no. we may not see it. We may not see it. I don't know. It's performing really well. So. It is. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, but Daniel, I want to ask you this question. We've had Bond for 50 plus years. Mm-hmm. How many more years of James Bond movies do you think we have? Uh, wow. Um, I, I feel like- not that many. <laughs> just, oh, just whoa! Because, just because, <laughs> just because. Um, you know, I mean, and maybe it is one of those things that's just always going to be there in some shape or form. Maybe we'll have like, maybe there will be like a Doctor Who thing where there's a break and it's gone and then it comes back. You and know? then all five living James Bonds <laughs> <laughs> reprise James several. Bond in game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it could very well be something that just, you know, continues for a very long time. But I think it's relevance. I- I'm just not sure because, you know, we're, we're, Starting to get more and more in tune with um, the stories of, um, you know, more diverse stories. And right now we have the most privileged man. I mean, not by birth, but by. No, he's a rich white guy. He gets gets paid to travel and stay in the nicest hotels. um, And he, you know is legally allowed to kill people. So, I mean, it's like the greatest privilege. Um, So, I don't know. That would be a great Bond movie title, The Greatest Privilege. I'm just going to say that. (laughs) The Greatest Privilege. The Greatest Privilege. Yeah. No. It just just feels like, not that people are going to, you know, oh, I don't want to watch this anymore. But I just wonder how long until they run out of things you can do because we're essentially looking at you know, this character who has so much lore now, um, you know, how long until the stories that you start telling about him directly contradict, you know, previous movies, previous movies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, they, they already I don't know. Do, and I some believe. of them have, I think. <laughs> uh, but Ashley, what do you, how do you feel? How, how many more years of Bond do you think we have? So I wrote these questions, but I think the more I think the better question is how many more uh, years of good James Bond movies do we have? Well, I want the answer to both those questions um, then. I think I think I'll die before they stop making James Bond content. Um, how many more good movies do we have? I think that depends very heavily on the Broccoli's. Um, unfortunately, I would say that um, they have made some some smart decisions, but I think the longer Bond has gone on, I think that the Broccoli's sometimes uh, do hamper the evolution of the character in the franchise. Also, please. Uh, I can send you my reps information. I would love to be in a James Bond movie uh, at any time. Well, Various actually, I have Broccoli's. Barbara Broccoli on the phone right now. <laughs> Hello, Barbara. No. Um, but I think that's the, and I, and I think, and you can say this about literally any franchise owned by any specific person, but it is the difference where Bond is not just owned by a studio, right? It is owned by this specific family who has stuck their nails into it and mm-hmm. said, you're not going to, you know, it's Disney with the mouse mm-hmm. um, and it's WB with Superman. And, my hope is that as future broccolis come along, because it's the family business, um, that they continue to make really intelligent casting choices. I remember when Daniel Craig was cast, people were like, "Bond can't be blonde." People and, were so bad. Uh, it, it was it was it was it was wild. Um, and he is, you know, for my money, certainly if not the best Bond, like a top tier bond Mm -hmm. um they've also cast people who were not right for the time but turned out to be really fabulous choices uh, in my opinion like timothy dalton and i think if i really hope that they i don't think you have to listen to your fan base for everything but i do hope that the fact that people like idris elba are in the discussion for fan front runners i hope that that stuff is on boarded because if it is i think we could have like 25 or 50 more years of like middling to good james bond movies but I unfortunately think if we cast a, t- a Tom Hardy or Richard Madden, who or are Zac Efron, 
Oh, I guarantee well, you the conversation has been had. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I will pass away. <laughs> yep. It'll, it'll hurt my heart as well. I will. It will hurt my heart as well. But I just pass away. I guarantee you a movie executive has been like, why, why not Zach Efron um, for James Bond? Because he's, he's not English. That's why. I don't think they care. <laughs> I think they do. I think the Broccoli's I think care. They I don't. Do. I don't think Sony executives give uh, a damn. No, but the Broccoli's <laughs> have the final say on a lot of this stuff. Uh, little, yeah. So, uh, so my point is, mm-hmm. um, I think if and I like Tom Hardy and I like Richard Madden, so please don't argue with me about that. But um, I, I think if we get more of the same, I think we're gonna get twenty five or fifty more years of kind of what we got in the nineties. You know, like mm-hmm. oh, he's good looking. Oh, there's a good scene here and a good song here, but boy, that's, this is really just a, a movie. So we're, we're in this interesting, and I know that I wrote this question and I'm not answering it at all, um, <laughs> but we're in an interest. We're at an interesting precipice right now because we don't know what's happening next. And I kind of thought we were going to go full doctor who, and they were going to announce the new bond before I thought so too, before no time to die aired. But, but their answer has been, we'll tell you in 2022. Yeah, 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 wow. yeah. So I think that's actually kind of nice because you're letting Daniel Craig exit the have screen. his last which, which, hurrah. Which, by the way, most he's kind of the first Bond to actually get a real exit. I mean, we that. haven't seen the movie yet. That, no, that's no. But I'm saying I'm just saying as an actor. Ah, like, I see. I see. Like, um, it's not just that his contract wasn't re-upped. Most or something. exactly. Most yeah. of the other ones just they they just didn't activate their contract. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like Pierce Brosnan didn't know he wasn't coming back for number five. Well, I guess Daniel Craig had the better agents. Then. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I want to ask around. Well, can I answer the question? Oh, oh I'm sorry. So, I'm so sorry. It's, it's okay. I, I want to, I, I apologize. It's all good. It's, it's all good, Ashley. Um, I want to, I have a theory about how many more years we're going to have okay. James Bond movies. Um, I do agree with you, Ashley, that I think we're going to see James Bond content before until all of us die. Yeah. <laughs> but, I think we only get movies for the next 20 years at max. You think then it's all holodeck programs? No, I think what's going to happen is, is I think, um, I think the movies will kind of go back into a tropey stage. Like they will become a little silly. We'll get too many invisible cars. We're going to, we're going to go, you know, with future technology that I don't even know yet. Um, (laughs) And I do think, like Danielle said, they will take a Doctor Who break. Like Bond will disappear for a while. Mm Mm-hmm. And then I think we're going to get a James Bond streaming series. And since Amazon co-owns. I was going to say, did you think, do you think yep. that because it was purchased by history? Well, I also just think that like mm. if somebody were to do like an HBO level or a Queen's Gambit level series, like based on the novels, I think it would make an astounding television show. But do you think Bond is a character for development in that sort of like we usually With- only see him for like almost three hours now at a time well to me i think that's the only way you can evolve the character to stick around longer do you think mm. do you not think that if they do a television series it's not going to be some 18 year old actor playing bond i don't know because i'm not a cast that is first <laughs> uh you know i, I don't that's know what's like my fear i don't know what it'll be the, mm-hmm. the interesting thing will be is how long can the broccolis hold on to the rights what will Amazon change of the steel? Yeah. Because that's yeah, going to yeah. be a big factor. Now, Amazon did say that they're going to let them keep them on the big screen. But I still think I also think Amazon's going to be like, we need a James Bond show and we need it now. Hmm. Well, Jack Ryan did well for them. Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, Amazon is. Did I make the right? Did I say the right Jack? Yeah. Jack Ryan. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know the difference between Jack Ryan and Jack Reacher. But so. I, I think the current <laughs> Eon franchise of films mm-hmm. is. I, I think 2040 at the max. You think you think she's on her last legs? I th- I think we're on the downward slope. I really and I and I know like the movies have gotten bigger, mm-hmm. but I only say that because I can look at Pierce Brosnan and I can look at Daniel Craig's films and the storylines that they're producing. And yeah, they're yeah. great writers have wrote both yes, of those yeah, movies. Yeah, yeah. But they're still all grappling with what do we do with this guy outside of the Cold War? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I'd be like, cut the budget in half and force them to be great. <laughs> <laughs> and go to Canada, for God's sake. Look, the original Bond movies are B movies. Yep. And I think maybe we should embrace part of that as this character evolves going forward. Okay, can I? Yes, I'm sorry. Now, now, yes. <laughs> um, I'm super excited to do this, which is also, I apologize for jumping the gun. All good. Um, so we're, we're talking about, or the, the, this is not the, this is the penultimate question. Our final question will be, is James Bond so relevant? But I would love to go through each of the actors who have played Bond and through the lens, a modern lens mm. reflecting on them are each of these 
are their stories still relevant? And I think your question, your answers might change for each of them. Okay. So we'll let Danielle go first this time because I, back, I backseated her last time. Danielle, is Sean Connery's James Bond still relevant? Damn. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Probably it, the hardest one, right? <laughs> it, it's hard because I know that it set the tone, you mm-hmm. know, what the franchise is. And I honestly think From Russia With Love is one of the greatest Bond films ever made. It's Preach, oh, I am high fiving you. Yes. Preach. <laughs> it is. It's my favorite Connery. And I think that it can't be topped. I love it. Um, so, I mean, like, sh- I don't know. It's just so hard because every thing about him is so um problematic now yeah 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 (laughs) and then you hear you know people quoting him about like stuff he said in real life like yeah also not super great of a guy (laughs) so um yeah so it's really hard i i i look at his era with fondness Mm -hmm. in certain ways but um you also have to look at it with a little bit of pain all right, Jason. Uh, as a secret agent, yes. In dealing with women, no. I think that's big, fair. big mm-hmm. no. Mm-hmm. But in terms of like how he is a secret agent, mm-hmm. I think he's still very relevant. And he's he still to this day is the most, um, and it makes sense because Ian Fleming was live. He's the most like Ian Fleming Bond uh, with Dalton being the close tie. I was, yeah, I was about to argue yeah. with you. It's, it's a coin <laughs> toss about whether it's Dalton or Connery, but you know, um, but Mm-hmm. like he is the most I don't know because I, I still view like everybody talks about secret agents and stuff like that and to yeah. me in my head I'm always like James Bond is an assassin more than a secret agent yeah certainly yes. he's usually sent into places to just shoot somebody yeah he's not he's not usually <laughs> gathering actual yeah and then he stumbles upon the real plot or whatever Um, and Sean Connery is the one in terms of relevancy to being an assassin is mm-hmm. yes but Connery is as Danielle said he's a very problematic but also he's the guy that originated man talk and he slapped that girl in the butt <laughs> yeah which is probably God. the most offensive thing James Bond might have done besides a couple um, uh, there's scenes. more there's some, there, there, there's, some, there's some stuff other lovey dovey stuff but like <laughs> the man talk is pretty problematic <laughs> I, I yeah. think I think if you looking at this I, I, I'm sort of approaching this as like would I tell someone who'd never watched James Bond to check out this era oh okay um that's like the metric by which I'm coming to it. And I think as Danielle pointed out from like a pop culture perspective, I think Sean Connery bond is relevant because it's influenced yeah. so much that's come yep. since then, but it definitely comes with a big caveat of like, mm-hmm. but women, this was but filmed in racism, the sixties. This was filmed in the sixties. Yeah, very, if it's very <laughs> that, you know, and it, like Dr. No anyway. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think this is going to be a quick, dirty answer. George Lazenby, Danielle, is he still relevant? Mm-hmm. He's alive. He can find I'm... you on Twitter. I don't care. I'm personally not a fan. Uh, I think I'm not. I, I mean, I think his. I think his one film is pretty good. Um, but yeah, that the snow base because, is cool, right? Yeah, yeah. Like there's You're some, welcome, there's some Inception. Cool parts, <laughs> yeah. and uh, Diana Rigg is great. Yes, um, yeah. Personally, I'm not a huge fan, and a little bit of it is also knowing that he he didn't approach it the way I think a lot of actors approach the role, mm-hmm. he was just like, oh, I want to be that guy. I want to, I want to be cool. Um, which, you know, I, you know, I'm sure every actor who's played Bond was like, oh, cool. I'm going to be the cool guy. <laughs> um, but he just was very upfront about it. You know, he wasn't approaching it from like, what story can I tell? Um, so I'm not a huge fan. Jason. Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. In all aspects, because um, <laughs> one, not only does George Lazenby wear the suit that was later made famous by Austin Powers? <laughs> um, but he's the only Bond that gets married. As far as we know, uh, as far as we know, he he like truly falls in love with Tracy. And to mm-hmm. me, that makes him a very relevant Bond. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say uh, no. I think this movie is <laughs> I think I think his tenure is is infinitely skippable. All right. Uh, well, also, I do also want to point out he slaps the woman who later becomes his wife. Yes, he does. <laughs> That's true. It was the 60s. <laughs> I don't know. I know that doesn't explain it all away, but damn yeah, the yeah, 60s. Yeah, yeah. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> Civil rights. What? Woo. Women's lib who? Woo. This is a James Bond movie. All right. I think uh, we're getting into the two most controversial 
Uh, Danielle, is Roger Moore's James Bond still 100 percent. 100 percent. I love him. And here is why. Please. <laughs> um, there are definitely films in his stretch that I skip. Um, but a couple of them are my favorites. And uh, what I love about him as a Bond is that if you look at um, Daniel Craig, if you look at Pierce Brosnan, if you look at Connery even, they are so tough all mm -hmm. the time. And one thing that I love about Roger Moore is that he doesn't, he's not always trying to pretend like he's tough. Like he's got vulnerable moments, moments where, you know, Bond always like in a lot of the films, he, like his life is in danger. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of moments where Roger Moore looks severely freaked out. And I really <laughs> appreciate that because I think there's something to be said for like, you know, a bit of the softness that he brought to the role. And I think that you can still be an awesome badass while still, you know, showing vulnerability. And so that is why I think Roger Moore is great, relevant. <laughs> Jason, is Roger Moore's Bond relevant? 100% no. <laughs> what? This is the bell-bottom Bond. <laughs> he literally wears suits with bell-bottoms on it. Um, now, I like Roger Moore. I do. Uh, Roger Moore, I think, is probably the most suave of all of the Bonds. Um, but I think... And in, when he's good, he's very good. Yeah, but I, I think... To, yes, and when he, when a Roger Moore film is good, like The Spy Who Loved Me, like it, it is solid. Um, but I feel that, like for me, the producers and the franchise took the wrong messages or the wrong notes from the Roger Moore. And, and as he progressed through the series, he, to me, he kind of becomes the parody of bond that we all make fun of. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I feel like when you make fun of bond, you're making fun of Roger Moore's bond or Pierce Brosnan's bond. We're going to get to that later, but also, I mean, yeah, he, he, he wears bell bottoms as bond. like his bonds to me are even more aged than Connery's. Like, whereas like when Connery's, you look at how people are dressing, but like in terms of like the storylines and the way like Connery acts in some of those scenes, like I feel like that is a movie that could have been made 10 years ago. Whereas like every Roger Moore film feels like a 70s film. And also <laughs> I will never let Roger Moore um, live down that he brown faced it in Octopussy yeah. as Colonel Luis Toro. Yeah. <laughs> as the, the most like very. Um, to be fair. Connery was in yellow face. That, that is fair. That is fair. That is fair. But Colonel Luis Toro, I felt, was like wowzers of offensiveness. Yeah. <laughs> Not great. I also want to caveat it by saying that of all the actors who have played James Bond, I think Roger Moore might be the only one who's nice. Yeah, you're probably correct. Uh, you're yeah, probably correct. he was like a pacifist in real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he seemed he seemed like a lovely man. Um I don't think there his films are incredibly relevant. Um, I think there's a couple caveats of like there are some really, really good ones in there. And then there's a movie that has Grace Jones in it. So just like, I don't know, imbibe your um if you do intoxic kill, right? Yeah. Intoxicant yeah. of choice and like just watch the movie for Grace Jones. It is a personal favorite of mine that I know is trash. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know it. But I watch it way more than Goldfinger. <laughs> oh, well, this is a Goldfinger household. So. <laughs> okay. We're, okay. We're going we're gonna to have to get together and we'll do a double feature of Goldfinger. That's fine. <laughs> oh, no, no. That's, fine. Like, that's another thing that I, I meant to say this earlier in the strengths of the James Bond franchise is I also think that a strength of the James Bond franchise is that we all, I think all Bond fans, whether we like the same films or not, we all have like a silly, goofy Bond that we know is silly and goofy, oh, yes. but we love it. But also another strength of, of the brand as a whole is that you can put three people in a room and say, what's your favorite Bond movie? And we could all say a different yeah. Bond. Like that yeah, is, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's lovely. But now second, I think most controversial Bond we're going to talk about, Danielle, is Timothy Dalton's James Bond relevant. Um, to me, he is. Um, <laughs> That's the correct answer. <laughs> he was, I think, Timothy Dalton was the first Bond who I was sexually attracted to. Yes, Danielle. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, the rest of them, I think they're clearly all very good looking guys. I've never been into a single one until... Timothy Dalton. <laughs> he's he just he he's everything. He looks amazing. Um, License to Kill is not something I watch a lot. Um, it's a tough I, one. 
It's a tough it's, one to rewatch. Yeah. yeah, well, it's it's the it's like the least spy movie of all time. Oh, I like it. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is your opinion. It is. There's. Well, I'm just saying. Like, oh, you know, I'm just. I'm fully teasing. <laughs> it, it just. Uh, it, it doesn't have a lot of espionage in it, which you know. No. Is, <laughs> people need different levels of espionage, but. Uh, um. Yeah, it's hard because he only had the two. Mm-hmm. Um. I do think what's cool is um people have pointed out he is the most monogamous bond um mm-hmm. part of that being that he only had two movies part of it also being that like the AIDS scare happened during his run um so they were like let's not have him hooking up with everyone um but he is a personal favorite of mine <laughs> Jason is Timothy Dalton's James Bond still relevant? Yeah, I think so, because it's the thing where I think more people realize this now is that Timothy Dalton was the pre-Daniel Craig Bond before Daniel Craig. Mm-hmm. And you can see that the audiences of the late 80s, early 90s were not ready for that <laughs> uh, because they went they turned the dial way too far the other direction <laughs> they said, for a decade. Bring us back Roger Moore. Yeah. We're going to find a young man who looks exactly like well, him. Well, <laughs> maybe not Roger Moore, but in Pierce Brosnan is very Roger moore but they they decided they were like, we got to go back to campy. Mm-hmm. Like we got to go back to the silly over the top villains and we cannot have realism. Um, yeah. The Bond franchise is utterly failing to find a middle ground because then with Daniel Craig, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. He's going to kill someone with his bare hands. It is interesting because <laughs> I do agree with everything you said about License to Kill, Danielle. But I also think that License to Kill is is a good one to show people that are very like anti Bond or, my, mm. or people that think Bond is too silly and too like, yeah. because, because that movie License to Kill is just a revenge quest. It's brutal. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, and I think it's, it's for me, I kind of feel like it's an easy like entryway into Bond before you get to some of the more um, exact extraordinary or, or exaggerated elements of Bond. Mm-hmm. What do you think about Timothy Dalton? You like Timothy Dalton, right? Love him. Um, <laughs> he's also enjoying a really neat career, like Renaissance, oh right now, gosh. where like Timothy Dalton is cool. Yep, and he still looks so good. He looks of he <laughs> as he's aging better than Daniel Craig, and I think Daniel Craig is very attractive. But yeah, yeah no, when Timothy Dalton showed up in Doom Patrol, I was like, yeah, he looks really he good. Looks amazing, and and I don't know if you guys watched Penny Dreadful. No, um, I know he's like, in that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, he's amazing. He also so Ava Green, isn't uh, she? He also kisses yes. Ava Green, which means she has kissed two Bonds what? on screen. Good for yeah. Sir Timothy. Oh yeah, two of my good favorite for, Bonds. Good for I'm Eva so Green. jealous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. back to the camp. Camp. Danielle <laughs> is Pierce Brosnan relevant? Uh, I guess it depends on what you mean by relevant. Whatever you want, baby. It's your opinion. <laughs> I mean, I I think GoldenEye is great. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's wonderful. It's in my top three. Um, and then also, if you were a kid in the 90s, like GoldenEye was such a huge deal because of the video game. Um, also, Natalia is one of my favorite Bond girls of all time. Oh, um, yeah. Except for the she's... level in the video game where she kept getting in the way and I'd shoot her. Yeah, not that. Not that. That's a but... real thing, everybody. Go look at that YouTube video. <laughs> That's a real thing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, her, her character is great. Um, you know, she's not a spy. She's just like a, what is she a programmer? Um, yeah, she's a computer programmer. Yeah. Yeah. But she's like, she's, she's wonderful. She's one of my favorite Bond girls. Um, so I love that movie. And because of that, I can't hate on his era, um, because of golden (laughs) eye. Um, yeah. And then my dad liked him. So I always thought, you know, I, I know some people, some men who think he was like too pretty to be Bond, but uh, my dad liked him. And my dad is, you know, like the usually only likes the man's man type of guy. So, yeah, I think he's pretty cool. I think uh, I think people like him as a daddy's girl. I always I uh, completely appreciate the well, my dad liked it. So <laughs> I have a soft spot for it. Jason, let's argue. Is Pierce Brosnan still relevant? You know, interestingly enough. I think all of Danielle's um, assumptions about Goldeneye are correct. Mm -hmm. I do think that like Pierce doesn't get enough credit for basically bringing the franchise back to life because Mm -hmm. there were so many articles in the early 90s in movie fandom and, you know, all the magazines like Fangoria and stuff like that, that they thought that Timothy Alton killed the Bond franchise, Mm -hmm. like absolutely killed it dead. And there was no way that it was going to come back because, um, 
I forget his second movie, The Living Daylights. Yeah. Uh, the Living Daylights. The Living Daylights. The yeah. British, no, no, no. British uh, song of all time. Sorry, Living Daylights was, was the first, first one. And then it was License to Kill. Oh, License to Kill, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but License to Kill is the one that like a lot of people thought killed the franchise. And Nobody Go- likes my revenge quest. And, and Goldeneye, <laughs> Goldeneye um, really um, brought it back. So like for Goldeneye, I'm going to say yes. And for the rest of his films, I'm going to say no. I I think through the larger pop culture sphere, and so much of this is the video game, which Mm -hmm. is we and we Mm -hmm. talked about that ad nauseum in our Pierce Brosnan episode. Um, I think for the impact on pop culture, it's yes. But again, if I'm showing you the canon, I'm showing you only Goldeneye. Mm. Yes. And then I'm like, and no matter how much you like him, I'm like, please don't waste your time. (laughs) Unless you're a completionist and you're going all in, then it's all game. Uh, What about Jinx? I have, I was going to say, I have a little bit of love for Die Another Day. One being, (laughs) like, I know it's hot garbage, but, um, you know, and I will never argue that it's not. But um, it was was, your first bond. It was my first one in theaters. Mm -hmm. Um, There's also nothing wrong with liking something that's bad and knowing that it's bad. It's true. It's true. It's true. (laughs) Because it's like the entertainment value is there for you. So. Um, yeah, I also think Gustav Graves is a great character played by the incredible Toby Stevens. So um, I have a little bit of love for that movie in a this is a fun watch to just throw it on, watch it. It's not great, but um, I do love the fencing scene. It's about right. You like Madonna's cameo? It's very silly. You know, I could use, here's a controversial opinion. I could use less Madonna in all things. All right. <laughs> all right. Most specifically, Evita, but that's another podcast. <laughs> uh, Ashley, uh, okay, we're down to the final Bond. So I don't know if it's fair to do Daniel Craig because he's our Bond right at the time of this recording. So he is the most relevant i have an answer mm. for this if you, if don't you say no i'm coming over this table well here's the answer <laughs> it's yes for now yeah i think it's going to be no in about 10 years because and you don't think casino royale alone will well here's the thing because we just talked about right pierce brosnan how yeah, we yeah, kind yeah. of all agreed that goldeneye like kind of like singularly like stands above mm-hmm. the rest of his films mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so you got to give pierce a little bit of props of that and i do think daniel will get props for skyfall and and but even more so casino Royale, um and maybe no time that i i don't know we haven't seen it at this point um but the interesting thing about daniel craig's films is that they are very much a sort of there's no better way to describe this, a sort of Christopher Nolan type tone. Mm. All of them, because you can tell that Casino Royale is very inspired by Batman Begins. In fact, that's mm-hmm. where they got the idea. The Broccoli's actually even said that, that that's where they got the idea to, to reboot the franchise. Wow. Um, and I do think that Daniel you Craig. You love films, to give credit to Batman Begins. <laughs> uh, Dan, Batman Begins <laughs> is fantastic. Um, but. You know, the the Daniel Craig series of films, I do feel weirdly feel very much of their time period. And and you are correct that I don't think we can answer mm-hmm. this, but it'll be interesting to see that like in 2040, if we were to watch Skyfall, would we be like, oh boy, that's okay, definitely 2011. So I'm going to put it in the calendar. Danielle, can we pin you to come back in 2040? Oh yeah, yeah. And oh, yeah, we'll yeah. Revisit this. Um, <laughs> just, text, just text me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but other, no, we're going to holograph, holophone on you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, we got, got the holophone. Got it, got it, got it. Um, but no, I, I would say he's definitely <laughs> yes for now because he, he as well as like just Pierce Brosnan, he saved the franchise because Pierce Brosnan almost killed with day another day. <laughs> They actually, the second yeah. time in our lifetimes, they were all like, or my lifetime, uh, they were like, Bond's going to die and it's never coming back. And yeah. Daniel Craig saved the franchise. Um, so he is, is, of course, a yes. But I, I'm curious, again, like when we have this reunion episode in 2040, <laughs> will we all say yes again? I don't know. It'll be interesting. We're all going to look so good when we're 40. It, of oh course. My gosh. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, no, I. it's interesting because I think... We've already seen, I mean, I have at least, and I'm solely basing this on conversations I've had with other Bond fans um, over the last like handful of years, but I've already seen the love for Quantum of Solace grow a little bit upon That's revisiting. so interesting it. that you bring that up. <laughs> because like, I don't love that movie. Um, I believe uh, that was during the writer's strike and Daniel Craig kind of had to like write part of it. That is correct. Yeah, that is correct. So yeah. it's it's really not a standout film at all. But I have noticed, and I've spoken to a couple of other people who said that they have. I don't know how indicative that is of the fans in general, 
but it is much better watching it now Mm -hmm. than it is when it first came out. And part of that might be we've seen more of the character. And so we're able to kind of like project what we think of him now um, on him during a rewatch. I will say, Danielle, I am one of those people. We um, did a big James Bond rewatch last year. mm -hmm. And no, I will say Quantum of the Solace it gets a lot better if you follow it up very close to when you watch Casino Royale because they oh, are very much of a piece. It's a sequel. <laughs> but, but yes, exactly. And I will say that I preferred Quantum of the Solace over Spectre in rewatching all of Daniel mm, Craig's films. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, because Spectre doesn't suffer from certain downsides the way that Quantum of Solace does, but... Again, Quantum of Solace might just pull through because of a few good elements. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, and weirdly, I think it's because the one of its main problems is Quantum of Solace has too many action scenes. But weirdly, I think that also helps it make it less boring, mm, you know? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there we go. So it's interesting because I did want to ask to close this out. The title of the episode is James Bond still relevant. I really feel like we're all of a piece here, even though we've had various <laughs> differing opinions. So about what's our answer, Ashley? Speci- well, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to say my thesis and then, of course, let oh, everyone else okay. chime in. Please, Professor. So it seems to be that we're all like, yes, asterisk. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Y- <footnote>. Yes. <laughs> However, we all seem to agree that there are some things that continually need to evolve in order for it to stay relevant. And it mm-hmm. seems like the big question that we don't have the answer to is who's going to carry this going forward? Cause there's a big difference between I'm just going to pick three, three actors who are in the conversation between Idris Elba, Kit Harrington and Haley Atwell, right? Like all of them, it would mean something different if they took on the role. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> right. One of them would be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so if anyone, this is like wants to add, this is your final time to stand up before we're closing the class. So final thoughts on, is Bond relevant? And we'll throw to Danielle first because she is our hallowed guest. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's a yes and a no. Yes, because we love this character and we love this genre. Um, possible no, just because while we don't need to abolish the character of, you know, mm-hmm. a white man, um, how much more do we need to see? uh in that vein so yeah i i don't know (laughs) jason you know i'm gonna say yes just for the simple fact that like we just spent an hour talking about this guy and we had opinions (laughs) and we had opinions (laughs) and whether they were like right or wrong i kind of think that definitely makes them relevant so i'm just gonna say yes well, I'm going to I'm going to stick with my yes with an asterisk of I hope he keeps blooming and growing the way he has. Oh, like a sweet summer child tenure. of Brutus. I think I guess I'm going back to my to my answer. Absolutely. <laughs> if that's OK. Yeah. Just attack on to attack on one last thing. <laughs> I don't know if the character is relevant, but I think that the genre and franchise Ooh. is. That's a fair way well to put it. said. I like that. Now, we all know that the character of James Bond Jr. always relevant. So I think oh, that's. Uh, yeah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Where is my James Bond spinoff starring a dog? No, boy. That's, <laughs> a, that's a genius. Good Broccoli's going to hire me at any time. <laughs> and I have Barbara on the phone. Hello, Barbara. No. <laughs> wow. Uh, Danielle, thank you so much for joining us in our conversation of is James Bond relevant? Uh, would you please let our yeah. listeners know where they can find your awesome podcast and where they can find you online? Yeah. So, yes, I co-host the Anglophiles podcast. That is Files with an F. It is a play on Anglophile, uh, a person obsessed with England. And English media. Yeah, we cover um, British TV shows and British movies and franchises. We cover anything from um, British sitcoms from the 70s to stuff being made now. Um, Yeah, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, anywhere that you can find podcasts. Nice. Well, everybody out there, go listen to that podcast. We want to thank Danielle for participating in our uh, James Bond Jr. conversation, as I'm calling it right now. (laughs) Uh, Everybody, you can find recommendations towards James Bond on our 
website. Ashley, where, where can they find those? If you go to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading, we are going to have some reading and viewing options for you, of course, this round. There's a cute little Amazon widget. You go in there, you pick what you think is good, and your spy power, steal money from Jeff Bezos's pocket and put them back in ours. That's Woo! right. And we're also going to kidnap Danielle and keep her around on the Patreon over at patreon.com slash job. I mean, only if we can contain her. That's, yep, that's right. Uh, <laughs> depends, never will. <laughs> depends on how good our invisible car is. Uh, so at patreon.com slash Jawin, that's J-A-W-I-I-N, we're going to have an extra podcast with Danielle talking about the best Bond moments, some of our favorite Bond moments, so don't forget to check that out and support the podcast. You can find Ashley on Instagram and Twitter at Ashley V. Robinson. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Jawin, that's J-A-W-I-I-N. That's it for Geek History Lesson. Professor Ashley... Will you please close out this secret document file? All right, you two blunt instruments. Class is now dismissed. <laughs>